Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to ECE 2002. My name is Art Turlip. Let's get started. So today, we're going to be covering Chapter 14. And uh, in the syllabus, we have... Uh, this is should be a Wednesday. Um, looks like we'll be getting to Chapters 16 and 17 here on Friday. Uh, the amount of material you're going to be expected to know for the next quiz... Uh, quiz three is going to be this lecture and the following lecture. Okay, so we're going to cover uh, more on convolution today, show you how to use calculus to do that uh, right here. So we're actually going to do the, do the work, and then we're also going to look at some graphical methods that help build a more intuitive understanding of what these different convolutions look like. All right, so let's look at the homework real quick. Uh, the big focus for this quiz is going to be on convolution stuff, okay? Because we have uh, about three lectures on it, and we still, you know, there's some residual ODE, um, RLC circuit stuff. I might ask a question on that, but I think we probably mostly covered that in quiz two. Um, so... You know, expect on the final exam to be dealing with some RLC type circuits, and we're going to come back to those the circuits as well uh, towards the end when we start to look at um, our our impulse responses and uh, transfer functions that we associate with those very same problems. So they're not going to go away. I highly encourage you to do them, um, but for this quiz, expect it to be mostly on convolution. Okay. That being said, um, these are great problems for you to, to solve. Um, these will probably not uh, be on there, but you should do them anyway because it helps you build an understanding. I may ask you ones related to things like this. Um, and then uh, when you're looking at the properties of the impulse function, um, this one's a really good one, too, so I highly encourage you to do those. So, yeah, pretty much all of these are, are great uh, fodder for the uh, the quiz. And then there'll at least be one little question on how to do uh, discrete convolution. Um, may even be a kind of a long answer format or something like that. So um, have it in a form that's uh, legible. All right? I, I won't accept illegible work. If I can't read it, I don't grade it. So, all right. Uh, and then this is in the future. So, no big deal there. Uh, not as many example problems in here as I, as I would like. Um, hopefully by, whoops. Hopefully by now I've uploaded this uh, visual tutorial onto the Brightspace page. If I haven't, um, here you go. Here's the link for it. Uh, give, that a, give that a watch if you're struggling with the convolution concepts. Okay, so let's take a look at the first example out of the textbook here. What we have is x of t is equal to 2 sine 4t times the step function. h of t is equal to e, I'm sorry, 2e to the minus 2t times that same step function. Now, I know you're seeing these step functions and you might be thinking, oh man, what, this is a weird function. I have sine now and now I got to deal with the step function thing. Actually, every time you see this, you should be happy. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why, because it simplifies the convolution. If you don't have this in there, your convolution, uh, gets a little cranky. It's, it's a pain in the butt. All right. Um, we'll just leave it at that. So this actually is going to simplify our integral, all right? Quite significantly, in fact. So rejoice, be happy. What we want is to, and we'll do this in red because that's noticeable, find y of t. Where was it? Was it lost? I don't know. It's equal to this thing. So maybe we can find it that way. All right, here we go. We're going to do this... Uh, this convolution. So recall our definition. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use this. 
and there's another way you can write this, right? You can look at it like that. These two are convolved together and they are a joint function of t, or they form a function of t. It's defined as this integral from negative infinity to infinity of x of tau with multiplied by h of t minus tau. And we integrate over tau. Okay, that's our formal definition. You should remember that from last time. Okay, so now what we do is a, a substitution jutsu. Sorry, this is, that's all I got, guys. I'm running out of material, okay? All right. Anyways, let's put this stuff in. So we have 2 sine of 4, but it's not t anymore, it's a tau now. So there it is. U of tau. We have to replace that other t here. And then for h, we're replacing our old t's here and here. Oops, I forgot a parenthesis. There and there. with uh, t minus tau. So everywhere you see a t, replace it with a t minus tau. So this is e to the minus 2 t minus tau. And this is an h of... I'm sorry, not h. What am I doing? Uh, u of t minus tau. Okay? d tau. And this should look kind of familiar from what we did last time with these two step functions. Um, but we're going to elaborate on what those are real quick. So u of tau is equal to the following function on the tau track now, not t track, on the tau track. So it's 0, 0, 0, running along here, and it pops up, and it's 1 ever after. It's so happy, right, after it gets past 0. So it only cares about anything from 0 onward, or 0 to infinity, and otherwise it... When multiplied to anything else, it just turns it into zero. Well, the integral over anything that's zero, or for any period of a, of a function where it's zero, is just zero. So we can get rid of or toss out that portion of our function. We don't care about it anymore. So this obliterates our function prior to tau equal zero. And it just goes from zero to infinity. Now, what about this one? Well, let's have a look. Because this should do a similar thing. And it does. So if I look at u of t minus tau, we know what this function looks like. We talked about it last time. It has, remember, wherever this argument, interior argument is equal to zero, is where my drop or rise is, right? So it's when tau... Recall that our, our, we're running on the tau track. Our function is effectively of tau right now. That's what we care about. When tau is equal to t, this has a drop. Okay? So that's right here at tau equal t. And it drops off. All right? So same thing for this function, except we only care about stuff prior right, prior to t. So from negative infinity up to t is the only region I care about. Well, I don't care about anything until I actually get up to zero. So this whole area here is shot by u of tau, right? It doesn't matter. It's already zero. So the only region I actually care about then is from zero up to t. And that's going to become my new, that's kind of a funky way to draw that, from 0 up to t, okay? And so that becomes my new limit of integration. So I have 0 up to t. So what did these guys do? 
Well, all they do is set our limits of integration. Why is that? What the heck is going on there? Well, re recall our train example. So these two functions, what they're doing for us is they're starting both of our trains at zero and generating a nice integral for us to work with here. Okay? That's it. That's, that's their whole purpose in the expression. All right. So now we have our final expression here. Boom, we're done. This is our answer, right? This is, this is yay verily, uh, Y of T. Thank you, everyone. It's been great. We'll go home. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll solve the integral. Okay, I know you guys are clamoring. You want to see that integral. How do we solve it? Okay, so how do we solve this dang thing? Well, the first thing we need to do... Okay, go away. The first thing we need to do is we need to isolate this uh, in terms of just tau. So we need to get rid of if we can. Okay, we need to get rid of that T if we can. So how can we do that? Well, uh, we actually have a couple constants here too that we can pull out as well. Um, but this expression can get broken up. So we have four, and uh, if you split this exponential up, you end up with minus two t, and then it's multiplied to that e to the plus two tau, right? So we're just left with sine of four tau, e to the 2 tau, d tau. This is much more manageable. And so from here, what we're going to do is use integration by parts. Uh, to solve for this integral. We're going to do it two times. All right. Now, if you don't remember it, uh, it's just this, and we'll call that limits A and B. Uh, this is equal to U, V, minus, and these are evaluated on the interval, right? A, B, of V, DU. So when you do this part here, it's just U, V evaluated at B minus U, V evaluated at A. And we're going to see that it is kind of friendly in this one. So no worries. All right. So our first integration by parts we'll do in red. Um, so let u equal sine of 4 tau, which makes du equal to 4 cosine 4 tau d tau. And V is equal to 1 half E to the 2T. I'm sorry, 2 tau. And DV then is just equal to E to the 2 tau, D tau. And you can right away see here that um, our expression is just made up of U and DV. And so we have the following. Um, and again, we're just going to run with just this part. And then we'll substitute back in here and solve away. Okay, so we have 0 to t sine of 4 tau e to the e to the er, 2 tau d tau is equal to, right, not this side now, v, or I'm sorry, uv, which is 1 half sine of 4 tau e to the 2 tau, evaluated from 0 to t, because those are our limits of integration, minus the integral from Whoa, that was weird. Zero to t of uh, the following expression. One half e to the two tau. Four cosine four tau d tau. Okay. 
Uh, these two are gonna make two instead. So we're gonna just pop that out here. Oops. And through tablet wizardry. Rup. Rup. There we go. Very nice. And actually, um, we want to keep this on the inside for the next one. Sorry about that. My bad. We minus two. Okay. So actually, I want to keep that on the inside. My apologies. All right. So from here, what we do is we are going to do another s uh, integration by parts. And oops, let's do that in purple. So. Second integration by parts. We have u is equal to cosine for tau, which makes du equal to minus four sine for tau, d tau. And v is equal to e to the two tau, which makes dv equal to 2e to the 2 tau d tau. Again, right away we can see that u and dv are readily uh, accessible to us in this expression, and so we're going to do a substitution there. But first, let's go ahead and deal with this guy. Um, it's quite simple, really. Let's write out our expression from before. Uh, this evaluated at zero, right, as it comes in here, is just zero, so I don't need to worry about subtracting that bit off. And, well, I just replaced t with, or tau with t in here. That's easy enough to do, 4t e to the 2t. Okay, that part's done. Perfect. And now I'm going to write the rest of the expression here. Oh, I promised we'd do this in purple. Ah, uh, sorry. My bad. All right. So next we have uh, the same deal here. We're going to take the u and v. So this is going to be minus cosine 4 tau e to the 2 tau evaluated from 0 to t. And then we're going to subtract off further, not infinity, don't do that, there, t of v du, so that's e to the 2 tau, du minus 4, so plus, what is actually plus 4 on the outside, um, sine 4 tau, d tau. Everyone should be able to see that uh, all this stuff here, the v du is coming from here and here. All right. And close that bracket. Oh, all right. Wow, good job, Art. You've uh, you've taken a rather simple expression and made it a complete quagmire. That's perfect. Well done. Um, actually, I did something that makes this really easy to solve. But first, let's go ahead and simplify it, and then we'll see what we did that made it nice. And before we do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some colors here. So let's do zero to t of sine. 4 tau. I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, we had those gel pens. And so if you have gel pens, these are great for that. They were like currency in elementary school. I don't know why. It's really dumb. They're like 20 cents each. I guess school is like a prison. That makes sense. Okay, so I don't want to write that in green. I'm going to write this part in blue. Okay, evaluating this integral here, we have minus uh, cosine of 4 tau, but this is at t, and e to the 2t again. And then that's minus, minus, so then we have plus, this whole thing evaluated at zero, well, cosine at zero is just one, and e to the two 
z times zero is one. So this just becomes one. And then that minus sign distributes over to the four as well. So this, uh, this part here was just this part here. All right. And let me actually change my colors again here. This is minus four, zero to T, E to the two tau, sine four tau, D tau. All right, and I'm about to use some crazy algebra. So check this out. This guy is gonna become, you can call it whatever you want, right? When you do these uh, variable substitutions. Uh, since I have my math license, I'm gonna call it spooky ghost. All right, like from Pac-Man. There we go, so minus four spooky ghosts. And spooky ghost is what we're solving for in the end, right? So it makes life easy. <laughs> so we have one half sine or e to the 2t minus cosine 4t e to the 2t plus 1. All right, so all I got to do is move this, mm, this part of the expression over to the other side. So I have 5 spooky ghosts is equal to 1 over 2 sine 4t. And you can see here, we just, you know, divide both sides by five and we'll get the original expression we want. Um, spooky ghost aside, <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, if you're gonna do a variable substitution, why, why not make it fun, right? Okay. I could have called it A or something. I don't know. That would have been boring though. Okay, so you should be able to see where this is gonna end up. All right, that's it. That's our whole expression. And if you recall, um, we started off with y of t is equal to that, that deal there, right? So let's write y of t in there. So this is equal to y of t. And this is equal to that convolution that we wanted so desperately at the beginning. Okay, you guys wanted me to do all the calculus. I wanted to leave it in an integral form, all right? Ta-da, we're all done, right? Well, actually, no. No, we're not. Not at all. So the one thing to keep in mind here is that this, none of these functions exist before time t equals zero. So what we need to do is we need to tack on a ut function to have a correct, correct technically correct, uh, solution here. Because otherwise... If you go into minus t land here, you end up with some really funky stuff. In particular, with these exponents, right? These exponential decays go like this. But what happens when you take an exponential decay and keep working backwards? It gets, it gets very, very, very large. We don't want that. It would be bad. So don't do that. Um, don't give me a solution that doesn't make any sense. Give me a solution that makes sense. Give me the step function, okay? Perfect. There we are. All said and done. Good. We're happy. Yes. Got an example. Of course we're happy. Okay. All right. Let's start example two. Now, this problem is a little odd at first. I'll grant you that. So let's take a look here. This is t times u of t minus 2 t minus 1 u of t minus 1, and we're adding t minus 2, u of t minus 2. Oops. Okay, and we're going to convolve that with the function. It really doesn't matter what it is, to be honest, but um, the focus here is going to be on our x. Okay, so keep an eye on x as we move through here. We're convolving those two. We want to find, write it in red, uh, find y of t is equal to x of t convolved with h of t. All right, big hint right off the gate, or right out of the gate here. We have our function is already broken up for us into three terms, right? Can you see the three terms? 
here, here, and here. Notice they're blocks that are being added or subtracted to each other. So that makes them terms, all right? Another thing to recognize is that inside each one of these terms, T is consistent. What do I mean by that? Well, in uh, this block here, it's just T and T. All right, so T is consistent, uh, whatever, whatever the heck that means. Inside this block, I have T minus 1, and I'm taking U of T minus 1. Actually, this is very nice, and whenever you see this behavior, this is good, okay? We want to see that. Why? Because that means that this function can be re-expressed as something, as a function of not just t, but a function of t minus 1, i.e. we can do a nice substitution in here, okay? Now, if we look further at this last term, we have t minus 2 and t minus 2. There isn't a t sitting by itself. There's not a t, uh, you know, natural log of t or something like that. It's just t minus 2s everywhere, functions of t minus 2. So now we can see that these three terms can and should be treated separately. Let's look at the textbook real quick. So if I graph these out, it's just three pieces, right? And you could um, build this function together and say, well, this is the final function. Let's go ahead and convolve that with h of t, right? Bam, I've figured it out. This is what the function looks like. Well, that would be fine and all. And as a matter of fact, you, you'd be well within your right to just take this triangle and go nuts. But there's actually an easier way to approach this problem using substitutions. So what can we do? Well, what do we know? Let's go ahead and just take all this stuff right now and chuck it in the bin. <laughs> okay, let's just ignore that that even exists for the moment. So let's take x1 of t is equal to t u of t. Then we'll call y1 of t. So y1 of t is just going to be the convolution of x1 of t with h of t. Now, knowing our, um, our convolution rules from last time, recall that x1 of t plus x2 of t plus x3 of t. Whoa, okay. There we go. Convolved with h of t is equal to x1 of t convolved with h of t plus x2 of t convolved with h of t plus x3 of t convolved with h of t. Okay, this is the distributive property. We should all know that. We should all be familiar with it. It's just distributing that convolution right over to my three terms. It's distributing it over terms. So when I write this out here, I recognize that this is just one part of my final solution. So I know that yt is actually equal to y1 of t, which is the convolution of x1 and h. And then I can actually write this as y2 of t and y3 of t, where I have now x2 of t is equal to this um, 2t minus 1, u of t minus 1, whatever that may be. Uh, so y2 of t is just equal to x2t convolved with ht. That's nice. Okay. x3 of t is equal to t minus 2, u of t minus 2. And this should have a minus sign here. I apologize. Okay. And then y3 of t is equal to the convolution of x3 of t with ht as well. All right. So we use all three of these things together to form that solution. All right. Well, now I've broken stuff up, but what does that really get for me? Well, like I said, we're going to focus on this one for just a moment. So x1t involved with ht is equal to y1t, okay, where x1t is 
from t u t. We look at x3 of t, which is equal to t minus 2 u of t minus 2. Okay? What is this in disguise? This is really just x1 in disguise, right? Except it's x1 where the input has been shifted. The input t has been shifted to t minus 2. As a matter of fact, it's like a substitution, right? I just replaced every t that I saw in this expression with t minus 2. So that's actually pretty handy, and we'll see why here in a second. We can do the same trick with x2, by the way. This is minus 2 t minus 1 u to the t, or u of t minus 1. This is minus 2, right, minus 2, oops, minus 2 times uh, x of 1 of t minus 1. So what can I do with that? Well, as it turns out, it's going to change the way we perceive y2 and y3 here. If we can write x2 and x3 in terms of x1, why can't we write y2 and y3 in terms of y1? We can. So let's take a look at x3 first. And look at that, or excuse me, let's look at y3 first and assess that convolution and see if we can't get it into a nice form with y1. So y3 of t is equal to x3 of t convolved with ht. But this is equal to, we just saw, x1 of t minus 2. Okay. Convolved with ht. Uh, what I really want is x1 of t convolved with ht, because I know that that's equal to y1. So I need to get rid of this pesky minus 2 somehow. Well, recall what we did last time with the time shift. You guys are all time lords now. Um, we know how to do time shifting. Let's do a little bit of that and see if that clarifies anything for us. So we know that this time shift can be accounted for by looking at x1 of t convolved with a delta function, right, a sifter, and I just shift my sifter by 2, and it'll give me back x1 of t minus 2, right? That's equal to that part. Oops, I'll leave that in there. So if that's the case, then I just have this, this expression now, is my old version of this. These are all the same. And h of t just sits on the outside. Well, by my uh, um, commutative rules, right, and my associative rules, I can actually change this around a little bit. I can rewrite this as x1 of t convolved with h t. And I'm going to stick this delta t minus 2 and tell it to just hang out over here. Okay, you just chill out, relax. Let me deal with these guys first. So now I actually have that x1 of t or, uh, convolved with h of t. And I know what that is. That's equal to y1 of t. And now I'm convolving y1 of t with that delta. Well, that rule that we just did applies backwards uh, for y of t, or uh, y1, so this is actually y1 of t minus 2. It's just time shifting my output function now. Now we're getting somewhere. So I know now that y3 is just equal to y1, but time shifted. Same thing happens for y2. y2 is just equal to minus 2 y1, t minus 1. And now we can rewrite our expression. y of t is equal to y1 of t, of course. But now I have minus 2 y1 of t minus 1 plus y, 
1 of t minus 2. So I actually don't need to do three convolutions here. I just need to do the, the y1 one time, and then I can apply my input argument and any coefficients after the fact. It makes this so much easier to deal with. Now, as you practice this and get good at it, you'll recognize these substitutions right away. You won't even have to do the, the two pages of work we kind of did here to do the substitution. You'll just see, oh, hey, this is a function. Uh, it's shifted by uh, 1, and I've multiplied it by negative 2, and then I've shifted it by 2. You'll, you should be able to see that right away after you've done a few problems with this, okay? Um, and we're going to continue to do some convolution stuff. There's other ones in the homework. Just keep at them. All right. Um, you're going to see them more and more as we get into the circuit stuff too, which is great. Um, cause then you get the application of all this math as well. It makes the math useful, which is why I went from being a mathematician to an engineer in the first place. Um, wanted to actually apply it, right? What, what good is math if we don't use it? Again, all we need to do is solve for this convolution. This convolution is equal to the original xt, x1t, convolved with h of t, which is just equal to t u t, convolved with, what was it, an exponential something or other? 2e to the minus 2t. 2e to the minus 2t, ut. Okay? This we can do. That's This is easy. Um, let's go ahead and write out the calculus for it. This guy is tau u tau, and this guy is 2 times e to the minus 2 t minus tau, u of t minus tau, d tau. We recognize from last time that we can rewrite our limits of integration. This should go from 0 to t. And everything collapses a little bit here. We end up with just tau, or 2 tau, e to the minus t, to t minus tau, d tau. Not too bad. Um, we could pull out some stuff here. We should probably pull out this t to make our lives easy. So let's do that real quick. We're going to rewrite this as 2e to the minus 2t times the integral of tau e to the uh, 2 tau d tau. And you can look this up in an integral table pretty easily. Um, or you can just do the substitution, or I'm sorry, the integration by parts. If you do the integration by parts, it's pretty straightforward. All you're doing is trying to bring the power of, of this thing down in front. So you end up with a, a term over here minus that integral, and that integral just becomes uh, a nice little exponential function, which we all know and love, so no big deal there. So it's just a singleton in terms of the uh, integration by parts. Not too terribly difficult. So with that in mind, I'm just going to go ahead and write out the final solution here. And that's all times ut, because recall that we don't turn anything on before time t equals zero. So don't forget this as part of your final solution, or you'll be very sad, because you will lose sad points. Okay? And that's equal to y1 of t. If we want to put this all together, what we do is we write y1 of t, and then we write minus 2 y1 of t minus 1, and we can just add these right down the line, right? So y of t is equal to the sum of all three of these guys. So this would be uh, minus, oops, minus 2 times t minus 1 minus 1 half plus 1 half e to the t, or I'm sorry, e to the minus 2 times t minus 1. Okay, ut. And the ut would just go to the outside at the end of the expression here. Uh, and then y1 of t minus 2, and then you just have t minus 2 here, minus 1 half plus 1 half e to the minus 2, t minus 2. Okay, and then you just add all these together, right? 
and that is equal to your final solution, yt, which is your convolution of the original expression with the three parts, right, with h of t. That's it. All right, graphical convolution. So for this part, I'm just going to walk and talk through the book a little bit. So what we have here is a display of two pulse, uh, square pulse functions. One of them, let me zoom in here a little bit. Uh, one of them is this red dotted one here. You can see that here. And the other one is this um, blue dotted one. Okay, and their convolution at each time point, okay, is displayed for a couple of samples here um, as we move through. So when we first start off, what we have is the following. We have the red coming in like so. And right at t equals zero is when these two meet. Okay, and one is slightly taller than the other. And they're defined right here. So the book goes through an interval by interval approach. So the first interval is when you know, t before zero. So before zero, nothing happens. It's just zero, okay? During the second interval, we go from zero to two. Now, why is that? Well, the length of this pulse here for this first one, let me make sure I get my, my colors right here. So F is uh, blue, so we're good. So the length of this first pulse is three from end to end, and the height of this pulse is 2 point, oops, is 2.5, okay? And then our other pulse here has a height of 2, and it goes from 0 to 2, so it has a length of 2. So an interesting thing happens here. When you're looking at this, right, this has a length of 2, I am gaining more and more and more as I push, push, push through, push this guy through the other function here. This has a width of three. This one's F. This one's H. Okay, I'm pushing H through F. And as it's going from zero to two, I am constantly increasing the area that I have overlapping. So you can see here at time t equal 1.5, I've pushed almost all the way into my other function, my f function, okay? Here's h, and h is too wide. So you can see here, this is 1.5. I've pushed 1.5 units in time in, and I'm left with just 0.5 units hanging outside. So the only overlap I have, um, multiplying 2 by 2.5 by 1.5, right? So 2 times 2.5 times 1.5, right? And that's going to put me right here. So you can see how this grows gradually. If I had uh, at 1, for example, keep this even more simple, this would be 5 times 1. That puts me right at Five, right? So the amount of H inside of F, you multiply their, their heights together. This only works, by the way, for these square pulses. In other cases, you're going to have more complicated geometries that you're going to have to calculate the area for if you're going to do a graphical approach and not a calculus-based approach. Now, after it's been completely enclosed in here, meaning at 2, which would look like right at this point, Remember, this width here is 3, and this width here is 2. So I have an entire second, right, between here and here. I have one second where this is as much as it can be, as much as it can be, H is inside of F, all right? And so their overlap is complete. So I have... As, and the total amount of overlap is just the region. Let me do it with this one. It's just the region where this guy overlaps with this guy. And then you multiply them together to get that. All right, so a second later, after we've 
what I would call saturated, right? I'm completely stuck in here. Um, I finally get to three on this boundary and I start to emerge back out the other side. Start to merge back out the other side here from F. So H starts to emerge back out the other side from F. And so the area under here, I should probably do this in a different color. The area under here, their overlap is starting to shrink again, i.e. this is going down again. So you can see these four different regions that we have. We have this region before they intersect each other. Then the trains are crashing into one another. And then they've completely crashed into each other, right? One train is completely inside the other train. And it stays that way until it emerges back out the other side of the first train, i.e. f of uh, t. In this case, he, he has a lambda here. I find that confusing because we use different letters for things. But, you know, you can treat lambda just like you would tau. Um, not a big deal. Why? Because um, it's just the area under a box. And it's the gradual changing of an area under a box. So it's linearly increasing. There's no funny shapes happening here with this with this function. Um, or better yet, I shouldn't say that. I should say there's no funny shapes here or here, right? So that's why. Okay, so that's the first example. So this exponential function is coming in here. Remember, the exponential decay function looks like this. So we've turned this train around, like so, and we're running it into this function here, okay? So we've spun this guy around to form this, and we're shifting it forward, and you can see how this graph is just the one right here shifted over to the right, okay? Nothing too crazy. Nothing we haven't seen so far. Okay, so as our secondary train is crashing into this big, huge, oops, big, huge Mondo wall right here, we're going to start to see some interesting behavior. And we do. It has a sort of curvature to it, right? It's not exactly an exponential per se, but um, it has some of that nature in it. And we've seen that with the solutions uh, that we've solved in the past. So when we um, convolved an exponential function over, uh, we ended up with uh, another exponential function. And, and actually, in the case that we did, for example, two, we had um, an exponential function running into three different step functions, right? So which are similar to these square pulses. So this should come as no surprise, the shape. It's a little shark tooth. Okay, so what's going on here in terms of this ramping up quickly and then deteriorating slowly? Well, let's have a look here. Let's go backwards. So at first, we're getting the bulk majority of this uh, function up front, right? Because it's this exponential decay. And so the biggest part of that exponential is up front, and then the train kind of tapers off, right? Because it looks like, it looks like this. And so when I hit, I smack hard with this, with this train. And so it goes up rather rapidly, like so. Now, as I pass through, right, at the point where I'm completely inside and I've gone through almost the entire length of my first train or my first function, I have only this, oops, get out of here. I have only this little tail left over, right? And so as I pass back out through, I lose a good deal as I'm co coming away, but I still retain some of this tail. So that little bit of tail kind of gives it an extra oomph upward, right? Because we're not hitting it with nothing over here. We're not putting nothing into the system anymore. Um, I'm sorry, we're not putting nothing into the system. We are still putting something in. So although I'm losing stuff, I'm still gaining something in as I'm doing this convolution. So this continues to go, and it will ev eventually start to try to reach zero here, but it will never actually get down to zero because I will always have some part of my tail still stuck underneath 
the other train, right? That first train. I'm still dragging a tail behind me. So this doesn't want to converge um, or, or decrease as quickly as this increased up here, all right? So intuitively, that should make sense to you. And that's the really the biggest takeaway from graphical convolution. Okay, this is nice and all. Um, it's To be honest, this isn't particularly useful until we talk about transforms. So I hate to say it, but um, unfortunately, this is kind of meh. Um, did the uh, next chapter that we do where we look at discrete world, this kind of stuff is super handy because when we have discrete points, it's much easier to kind of sometimes look at what's happening in a discrete fashion. And if you wanted to, you can actually pick out these critical points um, in a convolution process and say, hey, if I break it into these intervals where it hits, it's all the way in there. It's almost at the end, and it's completely passed through the other side. Those are the critical points you want to get. You'll nip them here, here, and then know that this goes to infinity in this case, or in order. When this hits this, that's the first hit. When this hits this, that's the second hit. When this hits this, that's the third hit. And when this, oops, when this hits this, that's the fourth hit. Okay? And then from there, they've completely separated from each other and we don't have to worry about them anymore so you can think about it in terms of critical points if you wanted to too okay now i think i've gotten through the entire chapter pretty much so i'm going to take a minute and digress into something actually more important i want to talk about some of the more important things that convolution does and is for us so if you do a google search and this wouldn't have been true like five to ten years ago necessarily even. Um, but if you do a Google search for convolution, the first thing that's going to come up, here it comes, machine learning. Yes, the magic word you words you've heard all over campus, I'm sure. Machine learning is taking over everything. And it's part of all these different things that you've seen um, out in the world there. And if I'm the first one to tell you this, that's awesome because I'm also the first one to teach you convolution probably. So you don't have machine learning without convolution. Let me say that again. Machine learning does not exist without the convolution process. Period. Okay? Convolution is what drives the entire process. So let me give you a couple other things here before we talk about that whole tangent. And from here on out for this part of the chapter that I'm talking about, this is not testable material. Okay? This is just for your own edification. So cross-correlation is defined as f of uh, t involved with, oops, g of minus t, okay? Where um, normally you would have f and g as two, uh, two functions, right? So let's say this is f, and let's say this sawtooth is g then what convolution is doing is, I'm sorry, cross-correlation is doing, is it's retaining the orientation on G, okay? And, it, and then it's going to run it through like that. Instead of flipping it across the axis like we do for normal correlation, cross-correlation leaves it in its current configuration. Um, the benefit of this is it, it helps for signal identification. That's probably the best way of putting it. Um, and it really is just a convolution in a different way, in a different light. The other thing that's important about this is that order then matters to a certain extent. Um, because with convolution, it doesn't matter what order you have. With cross-correlation, it does. That is to say, G, and I'm going to use uh, this operator, oops, this operator for cross-correlation. G star F is not equal to F star G, where this is the cross-correlation operator. So that's cross-correlation. Auto-correlation is defined as F with F, or, you know, whatever. Anything with itself, hence auto, right? I can't remember if auto is Greek or Latin, but um, it just means self so what this is doing is checking how a signal lines up with itself. 
Um, this is useful in digital signals processing. Okay, so what does this have to do with machine learning or deep learning? Um, which, by the way, deep learning is just a more complicated or larger version of machine learning. What it's doing is it's also taking in the feature extraction part uh, along with the classification, if you want to think about it that way. But basically, what's going on here is when I feed something in, when I feed some kind of input data into a uh, machine learning box or a deep learning box, right? I'm performing operations on it and I'm spitting out some kind of categorization usually or I'm spitting out some kind of feature extraction. Or sometimes it's just a, in some cases you actually can um, perform some kind of transform and a not well-defined transform on the, on the original image. So anyways, um, but what's in this box? That's, that's really the question of the day, right? What's in that box? So when I stuff an image in, in there, what it's doing right off the bat usually is it's doing convolutions. Would you believe it? You should, because it is. That's all it does. So an image is made up of pixels. And in fact, uh, it's better to think about it as, a, as an array or a matrix, right? And what I'm doing is I have all these little boxes that I'm trying out. And they've been kind of, you can think about them as being sort of primed, all right? So they all have an idea of what they want to be. Say this one's looking at this kind of feature. Maybe this one's looking at um, this kind of feature, okay? And this is like the most simplistic version you could do. These are all like, say, I don't know, three by threes. And what you're doing is you're taking this thing here and you're convolving it with the entire image and trying to see by the way when you do that you get a slightly smaller version of this you're trying to see where where this thing lines up really well with this thing okay so once you do that you say well um when i overlap this one right here you know i kind of get a hot spot so then you, you get a, you know, a really bright area right here. And maybe over here, it doesn't, the convolution doesn't give you anything good at all. Um, so maybe you get a really dark spot over here, okay? Maybe it's no good. All right, and this creates more matrices. This one creates this one, you know, this one creates this one, etc. And then from here, what you do is you perform more operations and, and more networking um, and more feature extraction, right, of after you've done all these convolutions, you do more convolutions and more convolutions. So it's just convolutions upon convolutions. Then you have some filtering layers and all kinds of other stuff in there that, that help produce your final categorization feature or transform, whatever the heck it is that you're trying to do. But the main driver in deep learning and machine learning is convolution. That's it. Without convolution, you don't have machine learning or deep learning at all. It's literally what has made it possible, along with advances in um, processing. Okay, Because to do all these convolutions, as you can imagine, even at a discrete level, is rather difficult. It takes a long time to do. Especially when you have, you know, a ton of images to help you generate the ideal um, when I guess you think about them as filters, right? The ideal, the ideal filters for those feature extractions. And then you can pull these things together and, and, uh, weight them together, um, to produce an output. So that's why convolution is so important. That's one reason. Um, another reason is just, uh, plain old image processing and there's all the transforms we're going to get to too. Um, but I think the machine learning example is one that's important to note because it's something that's so ubiquitous in uh, electrical engineering these days and a lot of other fields. And it's a hot, hot, hot issue. And it has a lot of legitimacy. It's not just a buzzword. However, comma, if you don't understand what the heck this thing is doing 
when it does a convolution and you you get some results out or something you have no idea how or why it made that thing so it's very important for you to develop the intuition and fully understand what the heck we mean by convolution here that's why we do all these toy examples and all these simple examples because when you get out into the field and you you know design something and you look at your filters or you look at your convolution layers and you say oh that's kind of a weird uh, thing that it developed right there. Well, what is it doing? What is it looking at? What does this thing do when it convolves with this? And you should have that intuition handy. Otherwise, you're going to be up a creek without a paddle. So that's why I I'm I stress convolution so hard because I think probably about a third of you are going to end up in, in machine learning stuff at least uh, or do it at some point in time in your career. And if not, you we're going to know somebody that does <laughs> more than likely. So anyways, uh, that's, that's my bit. I'm not a machine learning, uh, guy per se, you know, I, I, uh, I'm more into the pure stuff, but I recognize its popularity and power in, in our field. So anyways, that's going to do it for today, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and we'll see you next time.